Weathered boards share secrets in the night. Echoes of laughter now out of sight. Pale moons glow on empty streets. Spectral echoes where silence meets. A rail line's promise almost set in stone. Hope in the air and prosperity to be known. Yet shipping lanes intervened a twist of fate. Ghost town born at the rail line's gate. From Southwell's sorrow, inspiration blooms. A road trip beckons to unearth ghost town tombs. In the echoes of abandonment, a quest takes flight to real ghost towns where shadows write. Bordering Southwell to the west across the Pine River is a ghost town. There are a few reasons why ghost towns can arise and we will look at a few examples later. Southwell's ghost town came about due to a failure by the city to follow through on its planned Western Railway. In this video we are going to explore the causes and consequences of Southwell's ghost town and look at some real life examples. The Central Railway Station, serviced by intercity trains and buses, was going to have four stations connecting the land across the meandering river to the heart of the city. The first of the Western Line stations was built with the university town fast growing around it. Following the success of this extension, track was quickly laid in anticipation for the next stop. But things were about to take a turn for the worse. So why was Southwell trying to build this rail line in the first place? To answer this, we need to go back in time. During the age of steam railways, Southwell was looking to expand and a plan was drawn up to connect settlements across the river. At the time, Southwell's maritime trade and industry was at its peak, with ships and barges moving freight and passengers up and down the rivers and towards the ocean. For people and businesses living along the river, water transport was their only means of travelling to and from the city. So with the success of the intercity lines and growth in the city, funds became available to start construction on this ambitious line, with a few large bridges and stations to be built. The rail line would provide direct, fast and safe access to the homes and businesses upstream. The first station was built across the river. Bridge construction started but was never fully finished. Engineers soon found out that building the rail and accompanying road bridge would block the shipping lanes below. This is despite being 50 metres above the surface of the river, which is equivalent to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. The ships could not fit through the railway bridge's pylons. You see, City Skylines 2 is not perfect. There are many problems with it, and if you look at the subreddit or forums online, you can find many complaints on the economy simulation, general performance of the game, and lack of an editor. This problem was caused by these crazy restrictions on shipping lanes. The ships in the game are all giant cruise ships that require wide shipping lanes to navigate. I wouldn't mind the shipping lane width restriction if there were bridges that could cross it. Some road bridges can cross it, such as this future freeway bridge. Stay tuned for the next episode. But no matter what I tried, the railway bridges in the game are incapable of crossing even the narrowest shipping lane. Due to Southwell's reliance on water transport, sacrificing the upstream shipping lane was deemed unacceptable. A new plan was made to dig a massive canal, turning the site of the ghost town into an island, but the amount of land that had to be cleared caused the project to be delayed, and the railway extension to the west was all but cancelled. After this fiasco, remaining materials were gathered and used to build a much shorter line curving to the south. This is where it stands currently, with the last station ready but not yet operational, waiting for urban expansion to catch up to it. It is hoped that a solution to the shipping lanes problem can be found soon, allowing this extension to hook back up to the main line and complete the loop, similar to Auckland's City Rail Link. This would allow higher throughput and better access to intercity services for the university and the as yet unnamed station. 
Today, the ghost town remains with an abandoned station, a water pump, and some empty homes. The legacy this ghost town has left on Southwell is more than just the vandalized squatter field homes. It is felt in the delay in more rail extensions, in the high house prices, as the government expected many homes to be built along this line, and it can be felt in the massive freeway plans drawn up to accommodate this future growth. When I was building the city, this happy little accident that turned into the ghost town got me thinking about real life ghost towns. I thought I would talk about a few famous examples and what caused them. Then I realized that there are plenty of ghost towns in Australia, and one of them happened to be close to where I was going camping. So I decided to make a plan and visit a real life ghost town. Denison Town emerged in the 1850s and lasted roughly 50 years. By 1890, it had a hotel, butchers, general store, post office, bakery, and blacksmiths. Little information still exists about Denison Town today. This photo is the only photo I could find of the town showing the hotel. I had to visit the special collections in the State Library, assisted by a small team of friendly librarians to get this photo. I also found a Sydney Morning Herald article published on 23rd of December, 1861. Three armed bush rangers stormed the hotel and rounded up the three people inside. Mr. Kerr, the landlord, Ald, the cleaner, and a black boy. People were so racist then that they didn't even bother to write down his name. The article went on to say, a rope was produced for the purpose of tying them. They, however, not wishing to be dealt with in such a summary way, commenced to defend themselves against the armed desperados and, although being unarmed, made a vigorous rush and each succeeded in pinning his man." End quote. The men struggled and three shots were fired. One went through Old's arm, another in Mr. Kerr's left cheek and out his right, and one missed through his legs. The desperados were about to knock Mr. Kerr unconscious when the black boy escaped through a window and spooked the armed men enough to retreat. Fortunately, the men survived, despite the nearest doctor being two days away. Looking through the records, I couldn't definitively find a conclusion to this story. There was a Hewson, better known as Brummy, who was taken into custody for shooting Mr. Kerr, as reported a few weeks later in the Sydney Morning Herald. A police report also exists, which says a Billy Kent, who was wanted for cattle stealing, was one of the culprits. The third man has no name. Today, the only physical evidence that Denison Town existed is in the old cemetery. This makes it a literal ghost town. There are a couple of graves that are still readable. One of them tells a sad story of Hannah Bayliss. Her daughter, Grace, died not yet five years old in 1897. Just over a year later, Hannah gave birth to a son, Stanley. Hannah died four days later, probably due to complications in childbirth. Stanley died eight days after his mum, aged 12 days. May they rest in peace. Denison Town faded out of existence not long after Hannah's tragedy. With railways being built around the region, Denison Town missed out and was eventually superseded by the privately funded Leaderville, built closer to a silver mine about five kilometres from Denison Town. The town is in some ways connected to South Wales Ghost Town, which was also caused by a lack of railways. There are many ghost towns around the world in various states of decay. I found out about Denison Town thanks to an anonymous Google My Maps that lists 191 Australian ghost towns. Here's a few famous examples from around the world. Pripyat in Ukraine is perhaps the most infamous. The explosion of a nuclear reactor on the outskirts led to the complete evacuation and abandonment of the city. It will remain uninhabitable for thousands of years and the cleanup efforts are still ongoing almost 40 years later. Plymouth, the de jure capital of Montserrat in the Caribbean, was abandoned after the nearby volcano erupted. People still live on the small island, but are now confined to the northern tip. Some buildings can still be seen above the volcanic flows. Adaminabe, another Australian ghost town, was relocated due to the construction of the Snowy Mountain Scheme, a monumental hydroelectricity and irrigation project. The town was relocated and subsequently flooded with the construction of Eucumbine Dam in the late 50s. We can see there are many reasons for a town or city to be abandoned, whether it be natural or man-made disasters, major infrastructure works, or simply a town closer to where everyone works. 
One last thing. In the news recently was the discovery of an ancient Amazonian city. LiDAR was used to scan the forest floor and discovered a city 2,500 years old, predating Mayan civilization by a few hundred years. With these ancient ghost cities still being discovered, it makes me wonder, what will our cities look like in the far future? What will remain? Australian cities are already facing rising sea levels, intense bushfires and frequent cyclones. As climate change worsens, there may be new ghost cities appearing soon. And now for the cinematics.